Welcome to the Gospel City Church Podcast. We're glad to have you here. We hope you would hear, be challenged, and encouraged by this week's teaching. Head to gospelcitynow.com for more information. All right, so of Hebrews 6, we're going to be looking at verse 9 through 20. But before we dive in, I want to just go back a little bit to last week where Pastor David did a great job of walking us through those first eight verses. And I believe... As he said last week, and I totally agree, that out of the many views that we have on this passage, I think the writer is talking about people who don't know Jesus. Uh, Even though it seems as if they did, there's certain words that are used to describe them. They've once been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They shared in the Holy Spirit. They tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and yet they fell away. Um, I think these are people that were among the church, They heard sermons, they participated in gatherings, and at the same time, they did not know the Lord. Um, That is also my view, and I think it affects the way we're going to take a look at the passage for this morning. Because when we look at verse first eight verses, we see that he's giving this warning to those among you, or as he says in verse, um, let's take a look at verse one. Therefore, let us have the let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ, and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Uh, Verse 4, For it is impossible in the case of those who has once been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, and tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come to have fallen away, to restore them again in repentance since they are crucifying the Son of God. Um, but we see that he, he speaks of those who have done these things. Um, and now we're going to see in verse 9 that he changes audience. He changes the tone of what he's saying and goes from a strong warning to those who have been exposed to Christianity, they've heard the Word of God, to those who do know God and are persevering in that struggle of the everyday uh, fight that we have for our faith. Uh, so that's what we're going to see this morning is... This idea of perseverance until the end. If we are believers, if we are people who not not only just tasted the gift and shared in the Holy Spirit, but we've embraced that and we've believed that to be true and we're living that out. If we are those people, then we must continue to persevere until the end, which here I believe is either we die or the Lord comes. Uh, So that's going to be our main uh, thought for this morning is as believers... We must persevere until the day we die or until Jesus returns. And then we're going to take a look at some details about how we can do that and why we should do that. So if you have your Bibles, go there with me. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. And the first uh, question I want to answer is, who is called to persevere? And the answer to that, based on the text, is those who are beloved, those who are saved, and those who are bearing fruit. Look at the verse 9. Though we speak in this way, and remember, he, now he's changing from those who don't believe, they, they're in church, they hear sermons, to those who, he says here, yet in your case, in whose case? Those who are believers. Beloved. This is the only time you see this word used in the letter to the Hebrews. We feel sure of better things in comparison to the things that we saw in the first eight, eight verses. What are those things? He says, Things that belong to salvation. So these are people who are saved. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. So perseverance here in this context is being uh, being, uh, spoken about to people who are beloved by God, people who are saved by God, and people who are bearing fruit for God. Uh, they're, they're bearing fruit in their work and in the love in which they have for one another. Um, so as a Christian, if you are a believer, this is you. The writer of Hebrews is speaking to you. He's saying, this is who you are. God has loved you and he saved you. And you are now bearing fruit for him in the way that you're working for him and, and loving one another. Continue to do that. Continue to do that. It says, as you still do, um, continue to do that. However, you, church, you're called to persevere. You're called to continue moving forward, continue pushing through the opposite of falling away, as we saw last week. 
Those who taste, they see, they get excited, it comes and goes, and then something comes, life happens, struggles come their way, and guess what? They fall away from their faith, they leave Christ behind. And now we see a shift here, he says, but if you're loved by God, and God has saved you, and you're looking forward to better things, which we'll get into in a little bit, things that belong to salvation, that's what God has promised, that's what he's promised you as a believer. This world is not the end. There's better things coming our way. That is a promise that has been made, and we look forward to that. Not only that, but God hasn't overlooked you either. Because he says, God is not unjust so as to overlook your work. And a lot of times he says, well, here I am. I'm working hard, and, I, and we're loving each other as a church. And, and where's my reward? And God, when are you coming? When is this all going to end? And, and at times, we, you can feel that way. We can feel that way as if God has forgotten us. But here, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that he has not done that. That he has not done that. But at the same time, we must persevere because we don't know when we're going to die and we don't know when he's going to come. So until then, we continue to move forward and continue to bear fruit for his name's sake. We continue to love one another as we see here. So this is the who of this passage. This is who he's speaking to. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, listen to last week's sermon. And I say that very seriously. Last week's sermon was, was a very good warning for somebody who maybe comes to church. Maybe you're here and, and you're wondering about Jesus. Maybe you, you, you're here for a reason. Maybe somebody dragged you here uh, and maybe you don't care as was the case with many of us, including myself, when I was a teenager. My mom brought me to church. I had to be in church. Um, and, and God used that. I, I heard sermons that really impacted my life. Um, but maybe you're here this morning, and you don't know the Lord, and you're wondering, well, uh, how does this apply to me? Well, if we look at it in context, you'll see that those who have tasted, those who have seen, those who have been exposed to the gospel and have rejected Him, there's really serious consequences for that. But when you put your trust in Christ... You are now part of the family of God, and this, what we're seeing here, does apply to you as well. So we have a large audience here of people of different backgrounds, different places uh, in their faith, uh, and I want to encourage all of you, even if you are not a believer, hear me out, because this is what a life of the believer looks like. This is what you can look forward to when you come to Jesus. So... Those who are called are those, or to persevere, are those who are believers. Now, how do we do that? Verse 11, it, first by being diligent. The word in the ESV is earnestness. Uh, it says, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness or diligence or commitment to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish. So first we see this idea of persevering. Uh, then we see here, that he says he desires that each one of us shows the same earnestness uh, or diligence. It requires effort on our part. It requires work on our part. It requires that we be committed to this. It doesn't just happen. We can't just go through life and, well, somewhere along the way, we're going to figure it out. Uh, Stacy and I were golfing, we, and we joke about this all the time. Uh, we'll work on our driving, and we'll work on our chipping, and we'll work on our whatever, our irons, and we never putt. Uh, so we get to the course, and we start playing. Oh, they'll figure itself out. We, you know, somewhere by hole 15, uh, I'll make a putt, uh, and, and we just think it's just going to happen, right? Uh, all of a sudden, I'm going to become Tiger Woods, and I'm going to start making putts. Well, it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way. And, and when it comes to our faith, a lot of times we think, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be strong in my faith, and I'm going to stay away from sin, and I'm not going to fall away, and I'm not going to, you know, go in the wrong direction. It's just going to happen somehow, right? Some, I, by, by the time I get to 35, or if you're older, 75, or whatever it is, whatever age, or Bruce is saying higher, 95, right? Uh, by the time I get to a certain age, then I'll reach a certain level of maturity, and... When I get there, life is going to be different. 
I'm going to be closer to God relationally. And I'm going to have this strong faith. But without diligence, earnestness, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. We're still going to live a life of struggle. We're still going to go through life wondering, why am I not growing? If we go back to chapter 5, that was happening, if, if you guys remember in chapter 5, when Pastor David was talking about the, those who have, they're eating baby food, right? When they should be eating solid food. And, and these people were not growing. They were stuck. They settled. So instead of knowing more and, and growing more, they're like, we're fine. This is okay. Right? And here we're being reminded that in order for us to have this full assurance of hope until the end, which is an interesting phrase, but in other words, he's saying, if we want to have this assurance of the hope that we have in Christ until the end, until Jesus comes or the day I die, we must be earnest. We must be diligent. We must work hard. And then he says in verse 12, so that you may not be sluggish, or a different word for this is lazy. So that we may not become lazy in this. And then you fall into that habit of, well, I'll figure it out as I go. It'll come together. I'll stop living a sinful life. I'll stop doing such and such. I will read my Bible more. I'll pray more eventually. Because with age comes wisdom, right? And discipline. Uh, but then you get older and you're less wise and less disciplined um, because we haven't done that now. So this, this passage is reminding us that it's easy to get lazy. It's easy to say, well, you know, I'm just going to coast through life, spiritually speaking, instead of being diligent to have this full assurance of hope, as he says, until the very end. So church, if you're a believer, someone who's loved by God, has been saved by God, and who's been bearing fruit, be diligent in your spiritual walk. Be diligent so that you may not become lazy, so that you may not be just dragged through life uh, and, and, and pretend like, you know, you're going to get good results out of it. So we have to be diligent. Number two, we need to be imitators. Uh, look at verse 12, second part of it. It says, but, but, imitators so instead of being lazy it says be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises uh, and then in a little bit we're going to see the, an example of this with abraham but here he says instead of being lazy look at those who've come before you and look at the example that they have set for us and imitate their behavior this is a very common thing with paul paul says that Im imitate me as i imitate christ he says it in some of some of his letters we don't know if he was a writer of this letter or not. There's not cert certainty on that. Um, but he's saying something very similar to what Paul has said in other parts. And then later on in Hebrews, if we go to chapter 11 and chapter 12, this same theme is going to come back. Chapter 11, he gives a whole list of people, what, what's known as a hall of faith. Uh, and, he's got, and he says, so and so, look at what he did. And so and so, look at what he did. And so and so, look, look at all these things that all these people did all throughout history. Um, and yet at the end, they never got to see the reward. Uh, but, but look, they were faithful, and, and they, they persevered through trials, and they went through all these things, and God was faithful to them. And then when we get to chapter 12, he's going to say, now we have all this whole cloud of witnesses, which is a fancy way of saying we have all these people that came before us. And it gives us this imagery of being in a stadium with all these fans, in a sense, or all these spectators. We have all these people that have come. He says, now run the race that is set before you with endurance or perseverance. So the same theme comes up later on. And the writer Hebrews is saying, look at those people before you. Look at Abraham. Look at Isaac. Look at Jacob. Look at the prophets. Look at David. And now run the race. Live life. Live the life that God has set for you and don't look back. And here we're getting a glimpse of this theme of imitation, of us imitating the faith. And specifically here he mentions the 
expectations of certain people that have come before us. Church, there's a lot we can learn from those who've come before us. And here he's going to mention Abraham. He says in verse 13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. So if you remember the story of Abraham and Sarah, they couldn't have kids. They're really old. Even for that time where people lived longer, they were considered old. Uh, and she was not at an age where she was going to be having all these kids. Uh, so the thought of having a child was very slim. Uh, the, the, the chances of having a child was very slim. And Abraham and Sarah are saying, well, there's, this is not going to happen. Uh, I mean, look at us. And Abraham wants a child through Sarah. He has a child through his, his side chick, if you want to put it that way. Um, and now he wants a child with his wife. Uh, so God could bless their marriage and bless their lineage and bless their generations. Um, and, and you see what happens with the other child. He becomes a pretty a bad line of people. Uh, and then they have Isaac. Um, and from Isaac, we get Jesus. Not that they were all perfect, but God fulfill his promise by blessing and multiplying you and filling the nations with hope. Uh, so here we see the writer of Hebrews bringing Abraham into the picture, and he's using Abraham as an example of someone that was fa had faith in God and that was patient in waiting for God to fulfill his promise. So church, we need to be imitators. And in this particular context, imitators of people who have faith and people who are patient and they wait on the Lord. So Abraham trusted. He knew that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. However, it took some time. To be specific, it took 25 years for Isaac to actually be born. Um, and then how many years for Jesus to come through the lineage of Isaac? Uh, and how many years are we still going to wait until Jesus returns? Uh, so we see this idea of patience all throughout the Bible. Things don't come quick. Don't come quick. But the Lord calls us to wait on Him and to trust Him, to have faith and to have patience because that helps us to persevere in this life. That helps us to continue to move forward. It's what some people call future hope. We look to the future, and that reality helps us now. So when we look ahead and we see that God has all these big plans for us, that reality of the future helps me today. It helps me to want to live my life in a way that honors Him because one day I, I know I'm going to get a piece of what God has for me. So here I want you to see that we need to be imitators if we want to be people who persevere. Now, why? So we know who is supposed to persevere. We know what we're supposed to do. Why would I do that? Why should I persevere? This is the part, the part that all men are like, yes, just tell me what it is. Why should I do this? Well, let's take a look. Number one, we should persevere because God, the God we believe in, is a God who confirms his promises. Verse 13 and 14 again, he says that God swore by himself. And this idea of swearing or making an oath uh, is going to come up again here in verse 16. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So they're talking about this idea of God swearing, not saying bad words, but actually making a promise um, and an oath. And it's interesting to me that the, the writer of Hebrews says, well, God made this promise to Abraham and since he couldn't swear by anyone greater, so usually we'll say, you know, we'll put our hand on the Bible if you go to court. And, and you know, we're, we're promising, we're making an oath to tell the truth, nothing but the truth or whatever, right? Or we'll raise our right hand and things like that. Um, so we're, we're, in a sense, um, making a promise to a higher authority that we're going to be honest, that we're going to keep our word in our testimony. Same idea is being presented here. God is saying, I'm going to multiply your family. I'm going to give you a son through your wife, Sarah. He's making a promise. 
But then not only is he making the promise, he is confirming it uh, or intensifying it by making this oath, by saying, well, I have no one greater than me to swear by. I can't say, well, I swear on my mama's life, you know, or anything like that. So God says he swears by his own name. So he's putting his own reputation at stake. He says, I swear by my own name that this will be done, and that this will happen. I think that's an important detail. Because God could have simply said, well, yeah, Abraham, just trust me, I'll do it. And then here's God saying, I swear, I make an oath, I promise that I will fulfill what I am telling you. And then he, we see that this happens. God not only confirms his promises, he fulfills his promises. Thus Abraham, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise, his son. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So we see that here that with Abraham and with everybody else in Scripture and with you, God fulfills what he promises to do. Church, don't forget that. God fulfills his promises. And this is why we persevere, because we can trust that we have a God who's going to do what he said he's going to do. We can trust that one day when we die, we will be in his presence. We can trust that one day, if we're still here, he's going to come back for us. We can trust that he will do exactly everything he said he would do. Now, is that motivation for us to persevere? Yes. Because if, if you tell me, well, I want you to persevere. I want you to just push through all these life struggles and continue to trust God and be faithful, even though it's easier to not do that. But at the end of the day, I can't promise you anything. That's not motivating. That's not, I wouldn't want to do that. I don't know about you. Hey, come work for us, but we're just going to kick you out the curb and treat you like trash. No, thanks. I'm good. Think about it. I'm fine. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be part of that. But that's not the kind of God that we have. We have a God who keeps his promises to his people. We have a God who is still the same. Now, because we could say, well, that was with Abraham. That was with David. His business with those people, that was with them. What about us? But we see here in verse 17, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of of his purpose he guaranteed it with an oath so we know and we can trust that the same God that made promises to Abraham and kept them is the same God that makes promises to us and he will keep them too that he will be faithful to you as he was faithful to everyone else that has ever lived what God says he would do God will accomplish so church why should we persevere? Why should we walk through life struggles? Why should we rid ourselves of sin? Why should we fight this daily battle that we have against spiritual forces? Why go through all of these things? Part of the reason is because we have a God who never changes. And the same God that has done amazing things from day one and even before anything existed is the same God that we have today. And that is the same God that is for you. It is the same God who saved you. It is the same God who sanctifies us every day. God never changes. And the purpose of his promise, as you see here, also doesn't change. God is an immutable being. That sounds a little fancy. He never changes. And that is a very comforting truth for us to hear because, again, we can trust that he will continue to treat us the same way as he's treated others. Number four, God never lies. This is important. It says in verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. And there's other portions of scripture which speak about this, that God cannot lie. It goes against his nature to lie. So, because we could make the argument, if we're skeptical enough, we could say, well, God can make a promise. God can guarantee it with an oath. Well, how many people have you seen? They'll go to a court and 
you know, they'll raise their hand, they'll put it on the Bible, they'll do all these things, and then they lie, they straight up lie, and they don't care, right? Uh, or they'll just change their mind. But here's the thing, God is not you, and God is not me. God is a very different being. We're like him in many ways, but he is far above us and holy in his character, and we can trust that what he says is true. So we persevere because we know that God is not only one who makes and keeps his promises and doesn't change, but he will never lie to you and me. And lastly, God is our refuge. Look at verse 18 through 20. We who have fled for refuge, there's that word, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast or steady anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There's a lot in these couple of verses. I'm going to try to do my best to explain this as best as I can. Um, but here we see we, we, it says, we who have fled for wretched might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. The hope set before us, uh, as he's already mentioned before, that we have this full assurance of hope uh, is a future with God. Uh, and this is confirmed in the last couple of verses where he's talking about Jesus being the forerunner and going into the, tent, in, into the presence of God behind the Holy of Holies or into the Holy of Holies. Um, or here he says the inner place behind the curtain. Uh, so we know that this hope that he's referring to is a future reality of us with him, of us being with him forever. So we have this hope, this assurance, it's, it's a certainty. It will happen. Not wishful thinking, but it's for sure. So we take refuge in him and find encouragement to hold fast or to, or to grab on to this hope that we're talking about. And it says, and we have this, what's the this? The hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Now, the anchor was a symbol in Roman culture that became very popular for Christians at the time. Uh, and, and some people even say even more than the cross. And, and if you see an anchor, you know, it kind of looks like a cross in some way. Um, but, you know, you got the one going, the thing going up and then the two little things sticking on the side. Uh, but the anchor apparently became very popular because uh, it was non-religious People recognized the cross. It became a symbol that was associated with Christianity, uh, but the anchor, not necessarily. Uh, and the anchor was something that they looked to as a symbol for stability, for being grounded. Uh, so even if life kicks you and even if the storms of life come and the waves are just taking you all over the place, the anchor holds you down. It keeps you in place just as it does with a boat. So here we see the writer of Hebrews using this language to remind us that we have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor for our souls. It's not going anywhere, church. We can be sure that we have this hope that God has given us and it is there to stay. And we can be grounded in that truth. We can hold on to that truth as an anchor holds on to us as an anchor grounds a ship. So he says we have this insurance that the anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. So now there's a reference here to the temple. So Jesus goes in. Uh, in the Old Testament, you would see a lot of priests. They would be representatives of the people. So what that means is the priest would, would be, there's, there's a whole nation and then he would go into the temple and make the sacrifice every year. And he would represent the people. Um, he would go on their behalf. Not everybody got to go in. So he would go into God's presence and he would present the offering. And then God would forgive their sins uh, by putting his anger or wrath on the offering, uh, atonement. And then the priest would come out. Sometimes he wouldn't. Uh, but he was a representative. Here, we don't see the word representative. We see the word forerunner. And it says that Jesus 
went into the curtain behind the inner place, into the inner place behind the curtain where he went as a forerunner on our behalf. So you still see that language of he went in, in a sense, representing us. Uh, but at the same time, the word forerunner implies that somebody's coming behind him. Uh, he's leading the way. So he's going ahead of us. So he's, he went into the presence of God, the most holy place anyone can be in. And one day, guess what? We are going to go there too. So he says, Jesus did that as a forerunner on our behalf because he became the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, which we, Pastor David will get into next week in chapter 7. Um, but we see here that this amazing reality that Jesus went in, he was the sacrifice, didn't bring one with him, but not only is he our representative that dies in our place and takes the punishment for our sins, he also allows us to have entrance into God's very own presence. So when we come to know Christ, that is a reality that we get to be a part of. That is a hope that we get to look forward to. That is something that we get to hold on to. That one day we will be with him face to face. That one day we will be in his presence forevermore. All those verses we read that speak of this reality, all of that will be true. And it's because of this here that we're seeing in verse 20. Jesus went in as a forerunner on our behalf into the presence of God. And one day, we will be there too. Church, that's a comforting truth. And one that motivates us or should motivate us to persevere in this life. So as we look at the context of chapter 6, you see those two things. You see those who don't believe, but may be here among us. We're glad that you're here. But we want you to know Jesus. We want you to also have this hope that one day you will be with us. We want you to have this hope that you don't have to try on your own because you can't. But that's what we do. We try to appease our own God. And, and we fall short every time. We try to earn His love and His forgiveness. And the reality is, it's a never-ending endeavor. But in Christ, all of that is solved. When we place our trust in Him, He's the one that has gone in, and He's the one who's died, and He's the one who's paid the price for us so that we may reap the benefits. And we receive forgiveness, redemption, and a great hope of one day being with Him. And those of you who do believe, I want to encourage you to be diligent, to work hard, to hold on to this hope that we have. And I know a lot of times it can be difficult. A lot of times we say, man, how much longer, Lord? How much longer will this have to go on? But when we look at the scriptures and we see that he is a God who will fulfill his promises and he will carry us through those times as well. We are encouraged and we are motivated. We work hard, we're motivated to be diligent in our faith and we're motivated to seek him and to trust him. So I want to leave you with that, church. Persevere, not for the sake of persevere, but persevere because we have a God who has bought us with a price, and He is worthy of your obedience, my obedience. He is worthy of our life. And He, on top of that, has given us a great hope that we can look forward to. So I want to encourage you to persevere. Keep moving forward. There's no looking. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this morning. And for this text that we got to read here in Hebrews 6. I pray that you help us to be people that are not lazy in their faith. Help us to work hard just like we do for other things. Help us to work hard at 
being your child. Help us to work hard at being disciplined in wanting to be more Christ-like and wanting to be more like you. Father, help us to be people who are not lazy in their thinking, as we saw in Hebrews 5, in their learning, but that we would be diligent to know your word and to know the truth. And help us to not be lazy in our behavior, as we saw here in Hebrews 6, but that we would be people who are the opposite of those who fall away. Father, we thank you for this amazing truth that Jesus has gone into the inner place because we could not have done that. And he's led the way so that we would have access to you, so that we could approach the throne of grace, so that we could see you one day and live with you forever. Then it's all because of what he's done. Help us to not forget these truths. Help us to have this hope of a great future with you as an anchor in our souls, firm and steady and unwavering. We thank you for this morning. Thank you for this service. And we pray that we continue giving you all the praise and all the glory. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Gospel City Church Podcast. We hope you found encouragement, inspiration, and biblical truth that will challenge you and help you grow in your relationship with God. Our mission is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the city and to the church and to see disciples who follow him wholeheartedly. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review. This will help us reach more people with a life-changing message of the gospel. You can also visit our website at gospelcitynow.com to learn more about our church and our ministry. Remember, the gospel is not just a message to be heard, it's to be lived. So let us be sent out this week boldly bringing hope, love, and truth to the city and the church. Thank you again for listening, and we look forward to next time.